The last interrupt I'd like to present with the PIP processor is serial data, or the serial communication interface. This is the way that the computer is talking to your PIP board when you download code. It's also how GPS modules talk. To get a little bit of background, the way the serial port works is you've got the common ground. Again, you have to have a common ground for voltages to mean anything. And two wires, transmit and receive. On the transmit and receive, the point of one PIP talking to, each, to another, I'll have one PIP transmitting on the line that the other one's receiving on, and receiving on the line the other one's transmitting on. Um, it's important that you switch these two wires, otherwise they have both people listening on one wire, nobody's talking. On the second line, both people are talking, nobody's listening, and no data gets through. You need to switch these two. A, a modem which switches the two wires is called a null modem. If it's a direct connection, it's called direct connection. Part of the reason the serial port kind of phased out is there was never a standard. Some wires are null modems, some of them aren't, and they aren't labeled. Right now we don't really care because we're using the USB to connect to your port through the, to the serial port. Uh, the timing for serial data. The, for serial ports, the line idles high. To signal the start of the message, the line goes low. That's your start bit. The start bit doesn't contain any data other than just telling whoever's listening, data's coming, wake up, here, here it is. I'll then send seven data bits. Each one has a fixed width called the bit, or the how many baud. Uh, we'll be transmitting data at 9600 baud, so the distance of, or length of each bit is 1 9600th of a second. After eight data bits, I'll have either zero, one, two, or three stop bits. Then the next message can start. This is asynchronous data communication. I don't have a common clock. Everything is synchronized off the start edge. When I see the falling edge, that tells the whoever's listening that I need to take this, time it, halfway in the middle of the first bit, I'll then measure this voltage. Halfway over here, I'll measure this voltage. So I'm sampling the data right in the middle of each bit. Uh, to transmit data, on the PIC, that's built in. To transmit data, what I do is I write to a register called TX register. When I do that, the hardware takes over. The hardware automatically takes the transmit line, brings it low, that's my start bit, sends each the data bits one at a time, and then goes high again. Once the line goes high, TRMT goes high, and you're ready to send the next bit. On serial data reception, what happens is somebody else is talking to the PIC. Somebody else will send eight bits of data. There's the start bit, the data bits. The hardware will actually do the triple sampling, best two out of three voting, to find out what's the voltage halfway between the first bit, second bit, third bit, and so on. After eight data bits, I'll set a flag. The receive flag tells me the data is coming in and I'm ready to receive some data. Transmission is different than reception. Transmission, we didn't have to use interrupts. For reception, I do because I have no idea when the data is coming in. As soon as the data comes in, I've got to grab the data and do something with it, because the next byte could be coming in at any time. Um, so the hoops you have to jump through for data reception. I first have to set up port C as input on port C pin 7 and 6. That's serial data receive and transmit. The reason you do receive is because if you want to set up a star network where many devices are talking in the same line, only one device can talk on a line at any, any given time. The default is input. Default is passive. If I wake up and start transmitting, I'll grab the data line, data bus, and start, start transmitting data. Presumably, everybody else is listening, and only one person is talking. When I'm done, I'll release the line with TXEN equals zero, and somebody else can talk. Uh, next, I've got to set the baud rate. That's very important for serial data communication. For example, if I have a pulse that's this long, I, the data that I interpret depends upon the baud rate. If the baud rate is 20 milliseconds, I'm going to think this is my start bit, and my data is 1, 1, 1, and so on. If, on the other hand, I think the data, each bit is 2.5 milliseconds, I'll say here's the start bit, and my data is 0, 0, 0. The transmitter and receiver both have to be at the same baud rate, otherwise you get gibberish. To set the baud rate, 
You've got a couple registers you have to set up. We'll be using 9600 baud, so here's the setup for that. There are other options. I can go as low as 2400 baud, but that highest speed for a PC is 115 kilobits per second. In software, I do the following. Currently, I'm turning off the transmit and receive interrupts. And setting the these bits tell you that's 9600 baud. Um, if I want to send data to the pickboard, I can do that. To do that, I have to use interrupts. So I'll have to turn on the serial interrupt, the RCIF. What the interrupt will do is I'll read data from the PC. When I do that, what we'll see a little bit later is when I send the data, like hit a key on the keyboard, that will trigger an interrupt. First thing the interrupt service routine does is read the data. I'll echo back the data to the PC. I'll save the message to a buffer and then look for carriage return. Carriage return is ASCII 13. If I see a carriage return, I know that's the end of the message. Get ready for the next message. And I have to use interrupts because the data can come at any time, so I'm always waiting. The interrupts are always ready. As soon as the first byte comes in, I'll grab it, throw it in a buffer, and exit. That way I'm ready for the next byte. What the interrupt surface routine looks like is this. When I receive the data, I'll, that's an RC register. Well, actually, what happens first is if I hit a key on the keyboard, that sends 8 bits of data. After the 8th bit, that triggers the interrupt flag. Inside the interrupt surface routine is saying, hey, I just got a, a byte of serial data. Take that data from RC register, that's where the data is located, save it. I'll echo back the data, that way I can see what I'm typing from the keyboard. And then check. If it's uh, not a character turn or line feed, I'll throw the data into a buffer called message. If I have more than 21 bits in the, of data, I'll just clip it to 21 so I don't overflow my buffer. And then check. If I saw a character turn, I'll copy message 0 over to message 1. In the main return, then, I'll just display here's message 1, first row, second row, message 0. Since if I type, I go on the keyboard and hyperterminal start, start typing three rings for the Elven Kings, carriage return, actually, three rings for carriage return, the Elven Kings, carriage return. What happens is it sees the three rings for carriage return. That 13 tells the interrupt service routine, I just got a message, send it, or copy it over to message one, goes up here in the top row, and then wait for the next message. So keep on typing and say the Elven Kings, that appears in, the, in message zero, when you hit enter, that's copied into message one, and I can keep on receiving data. So that way I can receive data from the PC. Next problem. Suppose I want to receive the numbers 0000 to 9999, so I want to send data to the pick board. Uh, we have a couple ways to do that. We have an analog input, we have keypads. I can now use the keyboard. So from the keyboard, I can send data to the pick and maybe tell it to turn on a motor, um, turn on a certain light, you know, whatever you want. To do that, this is what I call programmer-friendly software. If you follow the directions, it'll work. I want to input four numbers, 0000 to 9999, and then have the main routine, receive that, and parse that, and figure out what number I just typed in. In the interrupt surface routine, same as before, I'm receiving data, it goes into a buffer. As soon as I see a carriage return, I'll set a variable called flag. That tells the main routine, I just saw a carriage return, you're ready to uh, parse that data and see what number I input. Inside the main routine, I'll then say, if the flag is set, that means I just saw a carriage return, now parse the data. The first bit is the hundreds bit, the second one is the tens bit, the third one's the ones bit. I guess I'm doing the number 0 to 999 here. The 48 is ASCII 0, so if I want to send the number 3, 3 is actually 51 ASCII. So ASCII 3 minus 48 is 3. That converts ASCII to binary. What that looks like, if I type in the number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, carriage return, that appears on the top row. The second row is the number that I input. It interprets the first three digits as 100 plus two tens plus three ones. It thinks that number is 1, 2, 3.
Another use of ser uh, serial data, it's probably more significant, is GPS. With GPS modules, I can tell you where you are on the Earth 10 times a second within a couple inches. They're also fairly cheap. Uh, GPS modules communicate through serial ports. And what the serial data looks like is the following. I'll get a bunch of GPS messages. These contain your latitude, longitude, uh, time, speed, information like that. What I want to cover here is how to read the GPS data into a buffer, how to parse the data, and convert to the data into meters so I know where I am. Starting out, to read the data into a buffer, we've already done that. That was typing from the keypad that stored into message 0, message 1. Um, it could really care less how you generate that ASCII data is stored into a buffer. Once it's in the buffer, I then want to parse it. The message I'm going to look for is the GPRMC. If the fourth character is an R, that's the GPRMC message. That R is unique for all the different messages. The different fields are separated by commas. The first field tells you it's the time. Uh, this was uh, recorded at 3.23 in the afternoon. Um, A tells me that the GPS data is valid. I have enough satellites. The next one is my latitude. Um, I collected data at 47 degrees, 21.42559 minutes north, 92.33, uh, 92 degrees, 33.10091 degrees west. Uh, basically, this was in Virginia, Minnesota. This is how fast I'm moving in knots. And then the last field would be the date. This is March 14, 2012. To parse the data, uh, conveniently, the fields are fixed. So the latitude is always uh, byte number 20 through 27. The longitude is always byte number 33 through 41. So we can just hard code it, take these digits one by one, convert to ASCII and multiply by scalar to convert to your latitude in minutes or longitude in minutes. I can then convert to meters by saying that uh, in Fargo, North Dakota, one minute corresponds to 1849 meters. Um, and 1334 meters north-south. And one knot is 0.54 meters per second. So doing that conversion, I can take the GPS data and calculate what was, where was I, in this case, relative to my starting position, zero. And what it did is it just started the GPS module, walked around the parking lot after about 10 minutes. This is in terms of time. The plot in terms of east-west, I started right here, spent 10 minutes at the parking lot, and then walked out to the road, came back to another road, walked around a snow pile, and then back into a building. That's some things you can do with GPS. I can tell you where you are on Earth within you know, a couple inches. Uh, the challenge as an engineer is, OK, now that I can measure position within a couple inches, what do I do with it? That's where the creativity comes into play. Uh, one last thing you can do with uh, serial data, I can encrypt data. In the serial data routine, I am echoing back the data that I typed. I don't have to echo back the data exactly. I could change it. That's called encryption. And there's a couple different versions. What Caesar did to make sure that the barbarians didn't uh, intercept his messages, he took all the characters and shifted them by three. Um, for example, if I have the message, three rings for the Elden Kings, if they add, two to, add three to it, I get you know, a message like this. That's not a very hard encryption scheme to, to crack. Another one is I could take the data and exclusive or it with a number. Here the key is the same thing as the decryption key. If I exclusive or it with zero, there's no change. If I do it with one, I toggle. Toggle twice, decrypt it, I'm back to the original message. Uh, the problem with that type of encryption is it's a one-to-one -one mapping. I can decode it just by counting the frequency of each letter. Uh, third type of encryption. Uh, uses a book like Lord of the Rings. I'll encrypt the first letter with a T H R E E, gives you more gibberish. If you ever see a Scooby Doo episode where they say the book is the key, that's what they're referring to. And the uh, best.